Hey everybody, it's Eric from epautos.com, your libertarian car guy, and uh, I wanted to share with you a few uh, driving impressions from behind the wheel of the 2019 Mercedes E-Class, um, which has uh, a few things about it that separate it from uh, other luxury sports sedans. Uh, and one of those things is, is that it's actually separated into a luxury and a sports sedan. Uh, you can get uh, a luxury version of it, uh, you can get a sport version of it. Each one is subtly different from the other, both visually and functionally. They share the same drivetrain, but on the outside, uh, the sport model has the big Mercedes uh, um, emblem and uh, badge embedded into the grill, and the luxury one has it more traditionally, the three-pointed star uh, up in front of you as you drive. Um, main difference, though, is the ride and handling. Uh, the luxury version is tuned to be softer, uh, more of a boulevardier. The sport version is, as you'd imagine, designed to be more sporty. Both of them share something that I find to be exceedingly uncommon in modern cars generally, and that is really good visibility. I'm going to pan around the car here, so hopefully you can see how relatively low, for example, the door sills are and how the dashboard isn't a gigantic blunderbuss bread box thing. You can actually see to the left, you can see to the right. Uh, you can even lean your elbow out on the door sill if you want to with the window down, which is something it's almost impossible to do in most new cars because the door sills are so high for safety. The reason for that isn't that it's a styling trend, it's uh, a way for the car companies to build structure into the vehicles so as to get by the federal uh, side impact crash standards. Now Mercedes obviously has passed those standards as well, but done it uh, without uglifying the car and without destroying visibility. And by the way, the same goes to the rear. Uh, I'll try and pan around now so that you can see the back. So visibility to the rear in this sedan is also excellent. Uh, in so many ways, this car reminds me of how, how cars used to be back in the 80s and 90s when, uh, in my opinion, they were far less likely to be in an accident. Um, new cars may be more survivable if you get into an accident, but in my opinion, you're more likely to have one because of the horrific blind spots which uh, will uh, result in people doing things like pulling out from a side street because they didn't see a car was coming the other way and getting T-boned. I think the safest car is the car that doesn't crash in the first place. And uh, so that's a real virtue of this car. Now, as far as bringing it up to uh, the modern times, you'll note that it's got the full Star Trek Next Generation uh, dashboard, two 12.3 inch displays, which actually look like a single display uh, because they have a common, uh, common clear facing, but they're actually two separate displays. Now, this is a 2019. Uh, it's not quite as advanced as the system that they have in some 2020s. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I reviewed a 2020 Mercedes that had what looks like the same system, except uh, it has two things that you can't get in the 2019E, uh, and that is uh, the screen is not a, not a full touch screen, first of all, and the second is it doesn't have the uh, um, Ask the Mercedes voice activation technology. Uh, that the, uh, the other car uh, I tested did have. Uh, that one you would say, uh, hello Mercedes or hi Mercedes, and uh, it, that would prompt the, uh, uh, the computer to be receptive to virtually any, any command that you gave it to turn on the seat massagers, for example, to adjust the stereo and so on. And that's a very helpful thing given um, all of the technology that's built into modern cars. Um, it's increasingly difficult to concentrate on driving and at the same time make adjustments to all of the apps and all the features that the car has. It's nice if you can just speak a command and the car will respond. And Mercedes has done a really good job of um, making it so that the, uh, the AI or whatever it is, the, the computer, can uh, actually register what you're saying without having to constantly repeat yourself and talk to it like you would a five-year-old. It actually, man, I'd say probably eight out of ten times, recognizes what you ask it to do and does it. So that's pretty neat. Um, some little things about the Mercedes in general that I really like. I like the, uh, the fact that they give you this little uh, thumb wheel volume controller. A lot of cars have a, uh, a tap switch, 
the thumb wheel controller is really ergonomic, really intuitive, uh, fits your hand just perfectly, and it, it's, I think, the absolute optimum way to adjust volume. Uh, some other little surprise and delight features about the car, uh, the Burmester, this is optional, the Burmester high-end audio system, which I think has 23 or 24 speakers. I'm focusing on the, uh, the, the eight-pillar door-mounted uh, speaker here because uh, it does this cool little corkscrew thing uh, when you turn the system on, it comes out, uh, and it's all backlit, and um, it's a phenomenal system. I think that the uh, the Burmester and the Meridian system that are, um, uh, is available in Jaguar Land Rover models, pretty much the the finest, the best audio rigs you're going to get in any car that's not uh, multiple six figures. Uh, I haven't had a chance to drive an ultra exotic in a while, um, so I can't say how they are in, in Maybox or uh, uh, in Lamborghinis and, and Ferraris, but I would imagine uh, that they're not that much better. These systems are absolutely phenomenal. I like the old retro touches. I shouldn't say old. They're just, they're cool. Mercedes was one of the first manufacturers to do the ball vents. Ball vents are superior, in my opinion, to rectangular square vents. You've got far more adjustability with a ball vent. It's not just up, down. You can move it left, right, um, and they look great. You know, it's an aircraft look to it, and it's nicely integrated with all of these modern touches. I also like the, uh, the ash wood that Mercedes uses on the E. Uh, and I think it's real actual ash wood too, uh, not simulated. Um, and I like that it's not uh, shellacked and super shiny as a lot of wood trim is. And the palettes, um, the combination of the cream color in this car and then the sort of uh, light gray and then the ash and then the, the pewter of uh, some of the facings for the, uh, for the trim plates. Just a really gorgeous car, really pleasant car to drive. My only beef with this car uh, is that there's no 12 volt power point? At least I couldn't find it. Uh, and actually, I think I know what the deal is. This car has an additional power point here in the center console for USB. Uh, excuse me, not a power point, it has a USB hookup. And ordinarily, that's where the 12 volt power point would be. Um, so if you opt for that 12 volt, uh, that, that, uh, that USB power point, you then lose uh, your 12 volt power point which is a problem if you have a radar detector or if you have another accessory um, that uses a traditional cigarette lighter style power point to get power. Uh, there may be another power point in the back seat somewhere. I haven't had a chance yet to go back there and look around for it. Um, but I'm surprised to find uh, that you have to sacrifice one or the other uh, in a car of the stature of, uh, of this E-Class. Um, finally, uh, and this isn't new for 2019, this was actually last year. Mercedes upped the, uh, the horsepower of the optional uh, twin turbo 3 liter V6. This particular car has that engine and it's now up to 369 horsepower. Uh, and uh, of course the, the standard engine in this thing is still a 2.0 liter 4, uh, which sounds puny and ordinarily would be puny given that this is a 4,000 pound car or nearly so with the uh, four cylinder engine. But they've really worked near miracles with these small engines uh, using the turbocharging and direct injection. And I know that these things have their downsides. Uh, those of you who follow my stuff know that I rant and complain all the time about it. But we're talking about a different type of vehicle here. These are uh, high-end cars, and if you're spending that kind of money, it's probably not that big a concern for you. You're probably leasing it, probably only going to keep it for three or four years anyhow. Um, but anyway, the point is that that little two-liter engine uh, whelps out uh, not only 245 horsepower, which is impressive for an engine that small if you work it out on a... Uh, power per liter of displacement basis, but also, uh, and this is interesting, and this is general, um, these little turbo engines now are producing tremendous torque and producing it at diesel-like RPM. Uh, you, you get, um, uh, I'm trying to pull the number out of my butt here, I can't remember exactly, but it's almost 300 foot-pounds, I think it's 270-something foot-pounds of torque from this little 2.0 liter engine. Uh, and that is a number that you normally associate with a V6 uh, in the three liter ish range if it weren't turbocharged. And that torque comes on, all of it, full torque output at just 1300 RPM, which is idle speed or not much faster than idle speed. Uh, and very close to what you would get if you had a diesel powered uh, under the hood. 
uh, diesels are appreciated uh, in part because of that high torque at very low RPM. That was, that's what makes them feel so so grunty at low RPM. You don't have to rev them, but boy, they just pull really strongly. Well, so do these little two liter gas engines. It's amazing that you can get uh, that much power out of that little engine and that quickly. And with that engine, this car gets to 60 in about uh, six seconds, uh, which is very impressive for an almost 4,000 pound car with a four cylinder engine. Um, the V6, of course, would be my preference. It's substantially quicker. Uh, it gets to 60 in about five seconds. Comes standard with all-wheel drive, too, incidentally. Um, the two-liter engine in this car is available either with rear-wheel drive, that's standard, or um, the Formatic for, uh, all-wheel drive system as an option. At any rate, I should have more up on the site shortly. Um, I also just posted an article that some of you may enjoy uh, about speeding and radar trapping and uh, how fast uh, is too fast and how fast should people be allowed to go. Um, so if you have a, if you have a chance, uh, swing by, have a look, uh, post your comments, let me know what you think, and we'll catch up with you again soon.